All right, so we've been, we've been doing the doctrines of grace, and I want to just kind of review and then just discuss application, and this is meant to be kind of a, kind of a dialogue, like what are some things we can take from this, and we talk about this together. So we'll, I'll, I'll go through some points as well as we sum it all up, and then uh, we'll go ahead and just maybe brainstorm what are some other ways this doctrine is uh, helpful for us even in the everyday Christian life. Okay, so we're just going to sum up a few things. So doctrines of grace is what we've been calling it. It's, it's a doctrine about God's grace into salvation, how he saves us, how he's in control of all things. And um, it's something that better helps us maybe tone it down a bit from the people who are very much uh, antagonistic to anything they hear about Calvinism. Um, Calvinism, to some people, is a trigger. And once they hear that name, they you know, tune everything out. Uh, Doctrine of Grace really emphasizes it's not, you know, Calvin or anything, but it's God's work. Uh, he's the one who did it, and it makes people more understanding um, to maybe be open to these things. So I like calling it Doctrines of Grace. We talked about that the term didn't, or, or the doctrine didn't start with Calvin. It was just, he really emphasized it in his teaching. And so his students who went abroad, they're the ones who really um, responded to the Arminians in their five points. So what we see with uh, the doctrines of grace and the, the whole differences with Arminianism is the balance between God's sovereignty and human responsibility. That's really where the tensions are coming together. And so we, we, we saw the five points of Arminianism. Um, and, it, and we saw that this came from even within Reformed theology, Arminius claimed to be Reformed. He taught in Reformed seminary. And within this, he was teaching his students one thing, as we saw, but then actually uh, affirming something different. Um, he was affirming the doctrines of the seminary, but then teaching his students something differently behind closed doors. And so his students then, after Arminius died, then took these points and started elaborating. Really, that summarized um, or emphasize human free will over God's sovereign work. And so they stress these points. We'll kind of just articulate it uh, here. Um, they held to that the atonement, uh, election, basically, so we'll start off first. God elects on the basis of foreseen faith. So there's a condition, right? So the, the uh, Reformed responded with, um, unconditional election, right? And these aren't in the tulip kind of order. This is in the order of the, the Synod of Dort. Um, another one, Christ died for all men and every man, although only believers are saved. So in other words, there's the potential to be saved. God potentially made them able to be saved. It's up to man, though, whether they're saved or not. Another one is they agree that man was depraved, but then they said, Man is so depraved that divine grace is necessary unto faith or any good deed, but there's enough good deeds that they could do in order to you know, reach out, take, believe, make the choice. But they need grace, is what they're saying. But they're the ones who are able to do it. Um, then they said grace may be resisted. And uh, what they're saying is... Uh, how the reform came back and say, no, it's irresistible grace. When God chooses to save you by his grace, he's going to accomplish it. It's going to be effectual. It's efficacious. It does its work. Um, and then they had another one that said, whether uh, all are truly regenerate or not, uh, they only persevere. Uh, they, they, he said this, the perseverance uh, of the faith uh, really needs further investigation. So in other words, we're not going to really settle that one is once saved, always saved. We're just going to, we just got to further in, investigate that. So one thing that I want us to just see from the get-go, and we said this in the beginning too, is these doctrines are not um, harmonious, right? Calvinism and Arminianism are two polar opposites. They're contradictions. So to say, oh yeah, the Bible teaches both, is really then to just say, well, the Bible is contradictory, which you do not want to say. So when we see maybe certain things within Scripture, maybe things that might seem like they're doing, oh, well, there's free will, oh, it's man's choice. We need to understand the context and in light of the big picture of what else God says 
in light of Scripture, right? So we see that with all of Scripture. Scripture interprets Scripture. Context helps us determine meaning. And so the Reformed responded, right? They didn't say, hey, here's our points we're going to stand by. They just merely responded to what the Arminians were saying. And what they said was, man isn't just partially depraved. They're totally depraved. Um, they're not saved based on the condition of foreseen faith, faith or anything like that. It's unconditional election. Uh, the atonement isn't done to make for all people and only those who believe it is, is applied to. No, the atonement is actually particularly, or in the words of the TULIP acronym, it's limited for those whom God elected. It's, and it doesn't mean it's limited in its power, right? It's, it's limited in its scope, who it's applied to. Christ died for the elect. Christ says he died for his sheep, right? Um, when we say, the, you know, they'll point, oh, well, God so loved the world he sent his son. Um, or Christ died for all. Well, context, again, determines the meaning of world, determines the meaning of all, right? In the context of world, oftentimes when we look at those pictures, or, or John 3.16, where it brings us up right after that, it says, if you haven't believed, you're condemned, right? And if you believe, you're saved, pretty much. So it's on the basis of faith, not saying, hey, it's all on your court now. It's man's choice. God's going to draw those to himself who will believe. We see that with other doctrines within Scripture that we wrestled with. We also see, um, not only is the atonement limited, or we would say the word definite or particular, um, is when God calls you to himself, it is irresistible or efficacious, effectual. Okay, so... What that means is, you know, someone, we brought out last time when someone says, do you believe in irresistible grace? And they said, no, I would never believe that God would save someone kicking and screaming against their will. And that's not the point. God actually changes the will. He changes the heart. He makes them willing and able to come. So they, it looks like from their standpoint, they are coming out out of their own desire. He's not, you know, obligating anyone against their will. They're doing what they want because God changes their nature if we understand all these other doctrines that came before. And then the last one is persevering grace, or perseverance of the saints. Um, This here is something that is understood in light of the great uh, chain of redemption that we see in Romans 8, the golden chain. And what that is saying is, if if you are part of one of those links in the chain, if God has called you, if he saved you, if he's sanctifying you, then you're going to persevere to the end. Um, you might have trials, you might have suffering, you might go through uh, maybe times of, and seasons of doubt, but if you're truly saved, if you've truly been elected, if the atonement has been applied to you, you will persevere all the way to the end because it's God who's keeping you. It's God who's protecting you, and he's the one who's guarding you. Okay, so those are the points kind of summarized here. Um, any questions or anything, just kind of what we covered? Mm-hmm. Uh, not a question, but more of a comment. Arminianism, it seems to me, that is a, uh, geometrically speaking, leads to the kind of abuses that we see now ar- around us as far as misreading God's word, um, the ultimate working out of Arminism, it seems to me that being part of the trouble that we're in uh, is, is, is a big part of that. Yeah, I, I can definitely agree. And, and part of it is, a lot of it is centered on um, what man must do or his choice and his free will. And so you can see how a lot of the preaching can be geared to maybe even manipulation uh, to try and bring those things about, rather than saying, here's what God commands, you know, do this and live, or else if, if you are part of the children of God, this is what would be evident in your life. This is the fruit of that. And so we can, you know, we want to preach and proclaim and, and command the, the things Scripture commands, but we're not trying to manipulate, persuade, or take away in a way that diminishes God's sovereignty in that. Um, so, yeah, I think... Yeah, you know, the, like I said um, la- a while ago, you know, we might all come to 
you know, the faith, thinking we made the decision, thinking, you know, we saw this, we moved forward, we did the initial act. And that's mainly because we hear the gospel and we understand that God awakens us and we come. But as he, we read the word, we start learning about who this God is who saved us, how we were saved. And so our convictions ought to change or our, our beliefs ought to change according to what the word of God prescribes. And so I think we might all, like when I was saved, I've, it felt like I made a decision. Um, it felt like I decided but I didn't, you know, I had to grow in the word. And as I grew in my understanding, I saw God was behind the scenes the whole time, orchestrating these things. Um, and I feel that that's kind of how most people start. And when people aren't expositing good, good preaching, when they're not under sound teaching and understanding God's sovereignty in light of those things, you're not going to see those things. It's going to be emphasized, you know, here's what we've done. So, yeah, I, I agree with that as well. Any other comments? Luke? That's one of the things that I've learned over the years that has given me a frustrating bad taste you know, many of the thoughts and the confusion that is, for those that at least come out of our that it's always added frustrating confusion of like, assurance Mm-hmm. Okay. One thing, while it's on my mind, uh, just you know, com- people coming out of Arminianism. What I've also seen, we've all heard the 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 phrase, the cage stage Calvinist, where they learn about these doctrines and then out of you know, out of really maybe zeal, but not love, they hammer these things and they, you know, and some even go and dabble in light of in hyper-Calvinism. They start at one extreme, go all the way to the other. And so there are dangers, and so we need the Word of God to help us stay balanced in these things. That brings something to a reminder? Yeah, I, just, I think to go along with the assurance, it's just uh, the confusion. You've got to be Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and we're still, you know, called to, um, you know, preach and proclaim. And I, I believe Paul even said, we persuade, right? And so it's this idea of we want to appeal. We want to show things are being beautiful, the truths of the gospel. Christ is lovely and desirable. We want to bring those out because the word brings those out. But we're not manipulating in that sense. We do you know, persuade, but we're not doing it in cunning kind of ways. That I think if we're leaning more into that self-centered manness idea with that Arminianism really is rooted at, I think we can be tempted in those things. Yeah, and I think the more you study true doctrines and scriptures, they inevitably help the believer overcome that uh, and persevere and hold it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Teresa, you had something? Um, just to make sure that I'm clear on this, because I've used this phrase before. Because um, I was taught that Christ's blood was sufficient, you know, sufficient, that all men would be, could be saved, but he only makes it effectual yeah. to the elect. And I like the way you said it's, his blood's not limited in power, but it's limited in scope. Whereas the Armenian, the blood is sufficient, but that you have to reach out and grab it. So it's not Christ isn't making it effectual at that point. It's a man's 
Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That phrase is correct. Yeah, that would I would say that's pretty much saying the same same thing like that. Um, and I would say, yeah, there may what basically Christ's atonement made salvation possible. We're going to say he actually accomplished it. So, the possible means now it's up to you. Are you going to accept? Are you you know he just made it possible. We want to say, no, it, it actually purchased something. He redeemed, right? And we see that. It's not, you know, he purchased us on the basis of, you know, only if you believe. No, he actually accomplished it. And if he did it for us, he will draw us in time to where we will believe. So it's, I like to say when I'm maybe talking to Arminians, and I, want, I need to remind myself to do it in a loving, gentle way, I'm not, you know, some cage stage Calvinist, um, by the way, what that phrase means is uh, when they, they get so ramped up about these doctrines, it's better to you know, put them in a cage so they don't get all crazy with it. Um, and that, that's, uh, you know, sometimes we all get through those cage stage senses where we need to grow and learn to love as well as we aff- affirm truth. But, um, yeah, these doctrines, when we understand them, can be exciting and we can get frustrated with people. Why don't you see this? And it means, you know, we were once there too. So patience, love, um, talking about these things is good to be reminded of. Um, yeah, so uh, any, any other things? I forgot what I was going to say right before that. Hmm? Yeah, so the gospel is, we, we hold it the free offer of the gospel, which we offer it freely, because we don't know who's elect and who's not. So we're not the ones to make the judgment call. And we're to, you know, we're to call people, right, come to Jesus, uh, all who open, he will, or all who knock, he'll open. Uh, all who come to him, he's going to comfort. So we, we, we tell those things. Uh, all who seek him will find rest. Um, the Bible also says no one's going to seek him because they need to be made alive first. Because they're all, you know, that's where the doctrine of total depravity helps us, is it helps us understand we're not just sick, we're dead. Um, and so sick people, you know, have the ability to reach and grab medicine and help themselves, where someone who's dead can't do anything unless they're first made alive. Um, and so that kind of helps us understand in light of all the calling that, yes, we're called because he makes us alive. So there's something that happens before, you know, those things for us to be able to receive the call is we come with the understanding that he made us. We, we may not understand that at first, but that's what's actually happening. Yeah. And so that's something we see there um, is God does draw us to himself because he first made us alive. So that helps us make light of understanding of when we see the commands to, you know, come, everything like that, come to me. We call people. We in, invite them to, you know, uh, believe, repent and believe. But at the same time, they can only do that if God's first made them alive. So in light of the answering the other question as far as um, is God judging those, um, so we remember in, in light of the doctrine of total depravity, everyone has sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. Everyone's deserving death. We've all, we've all broken his law. We're all condemned. And God would be unjust if he didn't punish those who broke his law. Um, the wages of sin is death. So he's doing what is a just judge would do. In his love, though, he chooses some that he elects to salvation, that he applies, that he atones for with their blood, by his blood, um, and he washes them clean, and he forgives them. But his justice is still enacted because the justice has been paid on Christ. So those who aren't in Christ, they are going to receive justice. Justice has to be done because this crime was committed. So Jesus, in our place, 
he received our just condemnation, though he was sinless. And so justice was still served. It satisfied God's wrath for all who would have faith in Christ Jesus. But for those who won't, they still have the justice of God because we're all under total depravity. We've all sinned. And some people will be more culpable of it than others, right? I, think, I believe there's different degrees of punishment and severity. Um, you see that with uh, the false prophets. You see that with um, those who may be exposed to the word of God or, you know, versus someone who maybe, you know, only heard it once or something. There's different degrees. Um, and so, you know, Jesus would even sell, say, like, hell will be hotter for those who, you know, do these things because they've been exposed and rejected it. Um, and so there's a sense in which, yes, they will pay for their own sins if they're outside of Christ because they don't have someone who paid for them. And so in light of that, um, for, for those who do, it takes all eternity. And that's why, you know, when we understand it, that's why we plead with people to repent and believe. That's why we proclaim the good news of the gospel because we should see ourselves as those who've been snatched from the fire and we proclaim to others also so that they may be as well. And we don't know who's elect, who's not, so we proclaim to all. Richard? My thoughts keep running over to the, the seed in the ground, the planting, the, the, the throwing out the seed, mm-hmm. the hard ground, the ground that takes a bit, and that which is fertile and already plowed. Mm-hmm. This, looking back, at my point of time of salvation, I can see where the being so hard and receptive, the soil being tilled, and then it becoming fertile. But the seed planted, as it says, the husband the husband plants the seed, but God causes it to mm-hmm. grow. Yeah. I, I, it, this, we're no longer in the picture. We just received the seed. And God causes it to grow. This and this, this distinction, it seems to me, this Arminianism, is, there's, a, there's a, a word there called pride. And this seems as though in this Arminianism and this always wanting to do something, you have a part of it, is a acknowledgement you still are unwilling to acknowledge that there's someone that knows better than you do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this, and, and actually has more power than you do, and is smarter than you are, and make better decisions than you do. So this, <laughs> mm. I, I see this picture. Yeah. That, that, just that right, but that, that fertile, the ground, God just takes that hard heart, and it, at your point in time, that you, you can see his preparation. Yeah, so you're, uh, yeah, you're hitting on something, too, that really helps us understand application. It's going to humble us, for sure. Um, this doctrine humbles us, but it gives God the glory. So we'll, we'll, we'll pick more, up more on that, too. But, yeah, that's good. Any other comment, Teresa? Yeah, I haven't read that book, but check it out. Any other comments before we dive into some application? Okay, so we know what the doctrine is. If you guys want uh, to study this issue more, there's a lot of really good books. Um, The one I've been using a lot for the study to really help us and simplify things is uh, called The Doctrines of Grace, Rediscovering the Evangelical Gospel. And it's uh, called, it's by James Montgomery Boyce and Phil Riken. 
That's a really good book. It's simple. We've been going through that with uh, the, the college and career. Seth? Yeah, so I definitely think, you know, I'm not, I believe, you know, there are Arminians who are saved. Um, and, you know, R.C. Sproul, I, I mentioned this last time, he even said when he was saved, he was Arminian. <laughs> and and uh, meaning he thought he made the decision. He thought he uh, did those things and decided. Um, but as he grew, and, you know, I think that's the, that's the idea of a lot of people that are experience of a lot of people of going through something like that. Um, when they first introduced to Christianity, maybe it, you know, maybe it's just the gospel, and that praise God for that. Um, but uh, as far as as far as the you know the churches, I, I think there are churches out there that are seeking to love God who have a different understanding of how God saves, and they're preaching a gospel. It's just you know the 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 efforts and the the drive a purpose for what they're doing it is maybe geared differently to what we would. Um, I wouldn't recommend a Armenian church to someone to go to. I think um, you know we should be to someone who's going to preach the doctrines of grace because I believe that's the way God saves and understands. As we look at our confession, it's very clear that uh, it's built on these doctrines of God's sovereignty and salvation. Um, and so, as far as going out and calling, you know. Uh, heretics or anything like that. I don't. I don't know if it goes to that extreme. I'm sure there are some who do, but uh, you know, I'm just thinking of some of the, you know, Armenian friends that I have, and you know, I don't question their faith. I question the doctrine that they believe, but uh, and maybe even some of the practices as far as methods in which they do, you know, altar calls and different things like that. But um, yeah, that's a. I think that really comes to discernment there. Um, if there's not another, you know, if you're in an area where there's not another good church in town who's a believer, you know, you have an Ar- Arminian church or a Catholic church, go to the Arminian church. Um, but, uh, um, you know, but I would, I would say um, we need to be very careful in, you know, in those things. And, yeah, there's a lot there. Um, you know, as far as leadership is concerned, the confession draws out, you know, here's, you know, the scripture draws out the qualifications, right? And then if we're saying we're a Reformed Baptist church, we hold to this confession of faith, they subscribe to the doctrines of grace, then we're going to expect our elders and deacons, you know, hold to those things, right? So, um, yeah, I, I don't know if it hit the whole thing there. But yeah, there's a lot there. Luke? I think one thing that helps me consider all that is the simple fact that as Christians, our minds are or should be being reviewed by Scripture, which gives the indication that at any given moment, we do believe whether we're going to make this or not, are continually growing. Uh, so that kind of gives pre Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're going to grow. We're going to grow in our understanding, and a lot of that has to do with, you know, our own humility and 
and grace towards others too. Kevin, do you have something? <laughs> yeah. That is true. That's true. Yes. Yeah. All right. Um, let's look at. So we've talked about man's sovereignty. We talked about. I mean, uh, man's depravity. We talked about election. We talked about God's sovereignty and how those relate to us. His atonement and then grace. How that relates to man's will. Right. So if we're depraved. Um, before Christ, our will has bound under the law, the curse of the law. Um, and in so doing, we're only going to choose that which is according to our nature. If our nature is depraved, um, then we're going to choose those things, right? All our good deeds, as the Bible says, is filthy rags in God's sight. They don't merit anything. Um, and so man's will is bound. We then, we could say there's a freedom, though, when we are made alive. We have a renewed nature. We can uh, serve God now with reverence and zeal. Um, and he gives us the ability to do it by giving us his Holy Spirit. Uh, we have an eternal security as well. And there are a lot of different you know, applications we can take from these things. One of the things I want to mention, though, is, as Richard hinted on as we were going, is the idea of God's glory and humility. Um, so giving the glory to God alone, right? That we, we all like glory, and we're all right to give God glory. We're all right to give him a majority of the glory. But if we have any part of that, um, really it's not grace anymore. And so giving God the glory alone is really one of the applications we see from these doctrines. If we understand how we're saved, what we're saved from, what God actually accomplished for us in Christ and how he secures us, we don't have anything to contribute, right? Unless, you know, you hear what, I believe it was Luther who says, we have nothing to contribute except the sin that made it necessary, right? And so God's the one who gets the glory, uh, so to him be the glory. James Montgomery Boyce has this section that I want to just read. And really the doctrines of grace, I think, what are, what are, being done. When, when I'm talking to an Ar- Arminian friend, you know, trying to do it in gentleness and love, I affirm what they're feeling. I affirm the sense, like if someone says, comes to me, hey, I'm a Christian, I, I decided to follow Jesus, I'm going to say, praise God. I'm not, you know, not going to say, no, you didn't. God chose you. <laughs> right? That would be unloving, ungracious. Um, it might be true, but you know, we want to, them to grow and understand. We want to rejoice with them when they're celebrating you know, these things. And so I'm going to rejoice. And, but, at, you know, as they grow in discipleship and in the knowledge of the word, and they're exposed to the sovereignty of God, um, I think what happens, and at least for me, this is my experience. As I looked at man's responsibility and what I did, um, I, it, was, it was very much viewed from the perspective of me. But when I started being exposed to God's sovereignty, I was exposed to it from the perspective of God. It's, it's looking at it from God's perspective, I think, how the Bible is trying to articulate it for us. God's behind all the scenes. Yes, it looks like we made this decision. It looks like we did these things in time and space, which means as we're looking at it from God's perspective and understanding he's holy, righteous, and sovereign, it means you have a high, high view of God. Um, and so Boyce says this in light of that. Having a high view of God means something more than giving glory to God. It means giving glory to God alone. This is the difference between Calvinism and Arminianism. While the former declares that God alone saves sinners, the latter gives the impression that God enables sinners to have some part in saving themselves. Calvinism uh, presents salvation as the work of the triune spirit, or triune God, election by the Father, redemption in the Son, and a calling by the Spirit. Furthermore, each of these saving acts is directed towards the elect, thereby infallibly securing their salvation. The contrast, Arminianism views salvation as something that God makes possible, but that man makes actual. This is because the saving acts of God are directed towards different persons. God's son, God, God's, uh, the Son's redemption is for humanity in general. The Spirit's calling is only for those who hear the gospel. 
And narrower still, the Father's election is only for those who believe the gospel. Yet in none of these cases, redemption, calling, or election, does God actually secure the salvation of even one sinner. The inevitable result is that rather than depending exclusively on divine grace, salvation depends partially on human response. So although Arminianism is willing to give God the glory when it comes to salvation, it is unwilling to give him all the glory. It divides the glory between heaven and earth for what for if what is ultimately makes the difference between being saved and being lost is man's ability to choose God, then to just that extent, God is robbed of his glory. Yet God himself said, I will not yield my glory to another. Isaiah 48, 11. So I thought that was you know, worthy to just read the whole paragraph of that um, and how he, he parallels the two. And how having a high view of God's sovereignty and God's glory really helps us see that we have nothing to contribute but the sin that made it necessary. And in so doing, that should make us, the next application, thankful. Uh, We should be thankful people, understanding exactly what we've been saved from, uh, understanding the extent that Christ did to save us and secure us, understanding that this was planned before the foundations of the world and the whole Godhead is active in it. Um, In light of who we are, and our sinfulness, that should make us very thankful. Very thankful people, which also should make us very uh, people who praise and worship God as a result. We give him the glory. We sing songs, hymns, and spiritual songs. We, we are attentive to come to the Lord in prayer and give him thanks and give him our requests because he's made that possible. Uh, we have an advocate to the Father through the Son, and in so doing, uh, understanding what he accomplished the privileges we have to be adopted in the family. Um, another application is it helps us to be clear about the gospel. It helps us to be clear about the gospel. What is necessary for faith? Right? The gospel is the announcement of good news of what Christ has done. Right? And it comes in light of our condemnation and the law. It comes in light of what we did to break God's law and deserving of death. And so the more accurate we are about the law and the gospel... Um, we can understand these things better and present them better. And I believe understanding the doctrines of grace helps us do that. Another thing it helps us do is have assurance. We talked about perseverance of the saints and uh, that doctrine that we see within that. And this will help us in light of the trials of life, the suffering, the sickness, the trials, the, the hardships, the calamities, Everything that happens in life, um, we have a God who is secure, who is working all things according to his glory. And if he saved us, he is going to secure us. And not one of them, as Jesus says, will be lost. Um, And so this gives us a great assurance that if we actually see the fruit of God's salvation in our lives, it's not our own doing, it's Christ's doing. He's working it out in us. Um, He's the one who put it in. We, We also call it a strive to work, to do good deeds. And if we see those things, that's fruit. That's evidence that you're truly a saved person. And so if you see those things in your life, even if they're you know, little compared to others, if you still see the fruit, you should have assurance in your life that you are saved, that, God blood, that the blood of Christ has been applied to you, that you have been washed clean. And yes, he didn't just save you and leave you up to yourself. He's going to sanctify you in the income glorification. And so there should be great assurance in there. Um, there's many more application points we could definitely give, but hopefully those are helpful there. Why don't we pray and we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for this time. And uh, Lord, we thank you that you are sovereign. If these doctrines, you know, we, which you tell us to proclaim and to preach, offend people, Lord, we pray for them. We pray for their souls. We pray that you would draw them to yourself. We pray that you would open their eyes to help them see the goodness and riches of Christ. And, Lord, we thank you that, you know, we can understand those things. And, uh, Lord, we thank you for that we can come here on this Lord's Day and just be edified and grow and uh, that your word can be proclaimed. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.